Thank you for joining us today. We're excited you came across this message. If you're joining us for the first time, I want to be the first to say welcome to Hope Church. Go ahead and open up the Hope Church LV app or visit HopeChurchLV.com and click connect with us to fill out a short digital connection card. Once again, thanks for joining us today. Amen, amen, amen. Well, good morning, Hope Church. So good to see you this morning. In light of this weekend, thinking about school starting tomorrow, it got me thinking back a little bit about my childhood. And so I thought as we begin this morning, I thought, man, let's just think about and talk about some things that when I think about my childhood, I'm really thankful for. Here's the first thing that when I think back on my childhood, I'm extremely thankful for. I am thankful that I was introduced at a very, very young age to the greatest breakfast meal on the planet. Ready? Ready? Toaster strudel, Pillsbury toaster strudel, cream cheese and strawberry flavor in particular. I know this to be true because I had it for the first time year, uh, in years last week. And I'm just here to tell you, this is it. Parents, you need to bless your children by going to Albertsons after the service and buying some toaster strudel. It is the greatest. The second thing when I think back on my childhood that I'm extremely grateful for is this reality. I am thankful that my parents did not disown me when I lied to my entire middle school about my house burning down just to get out of a school assignment. <laughs> the, the, <laughs> it, we don't have time for the whole story. Here's all you need to know. My house did not burn down, <laughs> but I told everybody I did, it did, and I got in a lot of trouble. A lot of trouble. It was not a good day for your boy when I got home from school and the counselor called my parents and they said, I think your son needs some help. Um, it, was, it was a tough day for, for Trenton and the Dorner household. But in all seriousness, when I think back on my childhood, I am extremely grateful that my parents made an intentional effort from the moment I was born until even now to consistently and clearly declare the greatest news in the world to me, the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'm so grateful for my parents. When it came to the gospel, the gospel wasn't just something that we heard preached about on Sundays when we went to church. The gospel was the air we breathed in our home every single day. This is true for my parents, this is true for my childhood, but it wasn't just my family who did this for me. You see, I had a community of individuals all the way from my younger years into adulthood that continued to invest the gospel message into my life and showed me how it affected every area of my life. You see, I don't love Jesus today like I do, and I'm not the person I am today without people like Rick Young, Matt Lawson, John Martin, Mike McCoy, Kyle Hurlburt, Scott Collins, Blake Evans, and many others who consistently loved me enough to declare to me the glorious gospel message and showed me how it affected every area of my life. See, I am who I am today because I've had people invest in me. You are who you are today because you've had people invest in you. And last week, Pastor Ricky preached an unbelievable message, did he not? Yeah. Pastor, Richie, Pastor Ricky can preach, right? He preached an unbelievable message about the reality that all of us have a role to play in accomplishing the mission of God. He taught us this big idea that the mission of God is geographical. How the calling on the life of every follower of Jesus is to help get the gospel to the nations. And this week... As we spend time in the same verse we were in last week, we're going to see one more aspect about our role in advancing the mission of God in our lifetime. So if you have your Bibles, I want to invite you to open it up to Psalm chapter 96. We're going to read just one verse today, verse 3. Here's the verse. It'll be on the screens. Here's what God's Word says. Declare His glory among the nations, His marvelous works among all all the peoples. This weekend in particular, we want to zero in on this really big idea. Here's what it is, that the mission of God is generational. 
Last week we talked about how the mission of God is geographical. We've got to get it to the nations. But this week we're going to zero in on this reality that it's also generational. That the calling on our lives is to make sure that the generation behind us hears and receives the best news in the world, what Jesus has done for sinners like you and me. This is the goal. And so as we begin today, I want to be very clear about my goal. About my goal for what I'm hoping and praying happens as a result of our time together. Here's, here's my goal and my prayer for today. I'm praying that Hope Church becomes more passionate and more engaged than ever before in declaring the gospel to the next generation. Thank you. Somebody's excited about that, all right? This is, this is my goal. I want to be very clear. Hope Church is a church that loves the next generation, that values the next generation. But I'm praying that as a result of our time together, that we would become more passionate and more engaged than ever before in getting the gospel to the next generation. And you see, this really came into perspective for me about a year and a half ago. A year and a half ago, I was driving my car, and I'm a podcast listener. Anybody else a podcast listener in the room this morning? Okay, you're my people. So I'm a big podcast guy, and I'm listening to this podcast, and it happened to be an interview with a pastor that I, I tend to read his books and listen to some of his teachings. And, and so this pastor was talking about a conversation he had with the president of, a, of an organization called Barna. Now, if you're familiar with Barna at all, Barna is a Christian organization that does studies and surveys across the globe and basically presents that data for pastors and leaders to understand how to best uh, continue moving forward the mission of God. And this pastor was talking about just a conversation he was having with this president of this company, Barna. And he just, he said that the, the president of Barna, his name's David Kinneman, he, he made this comment. It was almost like it was just an offhand comment. He said to this pastor, he said, you know, statistically speaking, after we've done all these surveys, all these studies, here's what we've learned. Statistically speaking, in terms of Christianity in America, America has reached a point of irreversible decline when it comes to Christianity. And it was that phrase when, when I was driving my car, irreversible decline, that just stopped me in my tracks. I found myself getting sad. I found myself getting depressed. But then he went on to say this. He said, the only hope for America, the only way for us to turn around this decline is for two things to happen. Number one, we need a widespread Holy Spirit revival to take place again in our country. We need revival to take place. We need God to pour out his grace and pour out his spirit in such a powerful way. That's the first thing that needs to happen. But here's the second thing. He said, and we need to raise up an entire generation of followers of Jesus in the ways and truth of Jesus. The only two ways for the hope of America, for that to take place, is for two things to happen. Widespread revival and the radical discipleship of young people. He said, if we don't do this, all we will do is manage the decline of the American church in our lifetime. And I remember listening to this podcast, hearing about this conversation, and for me, it just was clear as day. There's our touchdown. There's our end zone. If we're going to go for anything, those are the things that we've got to go for. Widespread Holy Spirit revival and an entire generation being raised in the way and truth of Jesus. And I'm hoping that Hope Church, that you and I together in this next season, that we would be more committed and passionate and engaged than ever before in making sure that the next generation receives the gospel. And so as we begin this morning, I'm reminded of this quote from a man named Ben Stewart. Here's what he says. You can't be indifferent about your personal investment in the lives of younger people if you care at all about the proclamation of the gospel. Here's the way I would say it. If you believe what we talked about last week, we must care about what we're talking about this week. And so from this verse, I want to give you one very clear reality statement. Just one reality statement that's going to set the tone for our time today. And then I'm going to finish by asking one question, all right? So here's the reality statement as we begin today. Every follower of Jesus, every follower of Jesus is called by God to declare the gospel to the next generation. 
Every single person in here, if you've had your life transformed by the gospel message, every single person in here has been called by God to declare the gospel to the next generation. And I want to give you four reasons why this must be a a reality in our lives. Here's the first reason. Number one, why we must get the gospel to the next generation is because, number one, the calling is just too clear. The calling is just too clear. Let's look at the verse one more time. Psalm chapter 96, verse 3. Here's what it says. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous works among all the peoples. Pastor Ricky mentioned this last week, but that word declare there, it's in the Hebrew word form of an imperative. Here's what that means. That this word, the the word for declare, to declare the gospel to the nations and to the next generation, it is not a suggestion for us to consider. It is a command for us to be obeyed. This this calling to declare the gospel, to get it to the nations and to get it to the next generation, it is not something that we can just consider if we're feeling good about it one day. It is a command that we must obey, but here's what I can already hear and feel in the room. But Trenton, I understand you're saying it's a calling, it's a command, but like, have you ever dealt with middle schoolers? (laughs) Yeah, I've dealt with middle schoolers. Fun fact, two weeks ago, I got up to preach in our middle school service, and no joke, it smelled so bad in that room. (laughs) Sixth graders smell. (laughs) They smell. I get it. I know they're crazy. I know they're wild. I talk with people all the time about serving in the next generation, getting involved in student ministry or something like that, and that's the response. I just, I don't know if I can deal with sixth graders. Here's what I'd say. Deal with seventh graders. Like, like they're a little less smelly. <laughs> Listen, I, I'm making fun, but here's, here's my point. We can't afford the callings too clear. All of us have a role to play in getting the gospel to the next generation. Whether they smell or not. <laughs> the calling's just too clear. Number two, not only is the calling too clear, but listen, here's the really awesome part. The message is just too good. Not only is the calling too clear, but the message that we have, it's just too good not to share with them. I love this. This verse here, it says, Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous works among all the peoples. This word, marvelous works, it's literally the word for it's beyond comprehension. I was thinking this week about how to talk about this um, In December, my wife and I, we celebrated five years of marriage. Yeah, come on now. We we made it. We made it. We celebrated five years of marriage, and so we decided to do what you do on your five-year anniversary. You go to New York. Duh, you go to New York. And um, the last time when we went, I I, I got some input from some people, and they were like, hey, here's what you got to do. If you do anything in New York, you've got to do two things. Number one, you've got to eat really good pizza, and you got to eat cheesecake. And I was like, amen, like that sounds like a good trip to me. And so when we went to New York, we, we found, in my opinion, the best cheesecake in New York. And it's a place called Eileen's. Now, Eileen's Cheesecake, you just need to understand, it's like heaven on a plate. It is heaven on a plate. Their New York style cheesecake with the strawberry, with the drizzle on top, it is literally to die for. The pizza, the best pizza in New York Prince Street Pizza. It, listen, nobody's been to New York here because clearly you guys aren't reacting to this unbelievable food. You need to go to New York. So we go to New York. We have this pizza. We have this cheesecake. And afterwards, I started telling everybody about it. Listen, I'm not even that much of a foodie. But I was like, good Lord, this literally is heaven on a plate. I can't not share this. So literally, just like a couple weeks ago, Pastor Jeff Phillips, our, our pastor over at our Henderson campus, him and his family went to New York. And you know what I told them to do? Eileen's and Prince Street Pizza. And they came back and they said, we went to Prince Street, but we didn't go to Eileen's. And I said, you did what? Listen, you can't afford when something's that good and somebody's told you about it, you've got to go enjoy that. And now this is, this is just simple. It's a funny illustration to communicate a serious point. Here's the reality. Whether it's cheesecake or pizza, here's the reality. We share what we think is worth sharing. We share what we love. 
And for me, it was cheesecake and pizza. But I, what I want to be very clear about this morning is this. The message of the gospel of Jesus Christ is too good for us not to share. It's too good. He uses this phrase, marvelous works. It's the, it's the word for beyond comprehension. Here's the way I would say it. The message of the gospel, it's mind-blowing, people. It is mind-blowing. Let's think about, just for a minute, some of the mind-blowing realities of the gospel. That the God of the universe, who has always existed, who spoke the universe and all the planets into creation, that God, yeah, he knows every hair on your head. He knows you so intimately and with such detail, it would blow your mind. And it's this God who created the universe, who knows you so intimately that he did whatever was necessary, even to the point of sending his own son to live for us, to pay the penalty for our sin, and to raise again from the dead so that you and I could be free from the penalty of our sin, so that we could be free one day from the presence of sin, and we can be free from the power of sin in our daily life. He He did that to save us. He did that to bring us back into his family so that one day when we pass on, we will get to enjoy him and be in his presence for all of eternity. When we start thinking about the mind-blowing nature of the gospel, we find out this reality to be true. I have to tell somebody about this. This message is too good not to share. I hope for myself, and I hope for us, that we can embody this prayer from Psalm 71. Look at this, Psalm 71, verses 17 through 18. This is a prayer of a man in old age. Here's what he says, Oh God, from my youth you have taught me, and I still proclaim your wondrous deeds. So even to old age and gray hairs, oh God, do not forsake me until I proclaim your might to another generation, your power to all those to come. May we be the church where this is our heartbeat, where this is our prayer. Oh God, don't let me move on until I get the gospel to the next generation. Calling's too clear. Message is too good. Number three, the alternative is too costly. The alternative is too costly. You and I are living in a generation where more and more students graduate high school after attending church all their life and yet leave the church never to return. Stats are showing from Barna that 64% of all 18 to 29 year olds have dropped out of church in the last decade. That means that almost two thirds of every 18 year old before they are 30 years old, will leave church never to return again. This is the generation we're living in. And you see, this isn't new. We actually see something like this happen in God's Word. In Judges chapter 2, we read the story of the people of God after Joshua has passed away. And listen to what it says. And all that generation also were gathered to their fathers. And there arose another generation after them, who did not know the Lord or the work that he had done for Israel. You see what's happening here. Joshua's moved on. He's passed away. And there's an entire generation that came to be that did not know the Lord or the work that he had done for Israel. Now here's the question I'd be asking. Okay, so what's the result? What happens to the generation that doesn't know the Lord? Well, here's what it says. And the people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and served the Baals. They abandoned the Lord, the God of their fathers, who had brought them out of the land of Egypt. They went after other gods from among the gods of the people who were around them and bowed down to them, and they provoked the Lord to anger. The results of a generation who didn't know the Lord are clear. They did what was evil in the sight of God. They started to serve and worship other lowercase g gods, and they abandoned the Lord. Here's my question, Hope Church. Does this sound familiar at all? About a generation who doesn't know the Lord coming after what happens is they they do what is evil in the sight of God. I I worked with students for almost 10 years of my life, and here's what I see is true about this generation. When they don't worship God as king, they worship something else as king. 
They've abandoned the Lord. They worship some lowercase g gods. And right now in our world, Generation Z is the most stressed, anxious, depressed, suicidal, and lonely generation the world has ever seen. This is the generation. This is the the danger of seeing a generation be raised up without knowing the Lord. But here's the good news. The good news is very simple. We've got the good news. The good news is simple. We have the good news. We have the good news of the gospel of Jesus that can heal all these broken places, that can redeem and set the generation free. Listen, the message is too good. The alternative is too costly. But here's the last thing. The opportunity is too great. What we have in front of us with the next generation, the opportunity is too great. It's been said about next generation before, that they're the church of tomorrow. But here's what we believe. They are not the church of tomorrow. They are the church of today. And we have an opportunity and a calling by God to steward the next generation, to make sure that we get the gospel to them. Because I'm convinced, what if, what if the revival that God's going to send in the, in the coming years, what if that revival that's coming doesn't come in ushered in on our backs, but it comes in ushered in on the backs of the next generation? What if God is waiting to send revival so that the next generation, we, as we disciple them and love them and see them come to know the Lord, what if it's after that takes place that God then decides to send the revival? Here's why I think that might be the case. Because God might send his revival, but if we're not ready to receive it, we might be in trouble. And so the next generation needs to be discipled, loved on, cared for, and and gotten the gospel to so that when God does send the revival, we can actually steward it appropriately. The opportunity is just too great. What could happen if an entire generation of followers of Jesus in the city of Las Vegas rose up taking the gospel message seriously, started loving people like Jesus loved people, started pursuing Jesus with all of their being? What could happen? Listen, I don't know all that could happen, but I do know this, that if that were to take place, if we got the gospel to the next generation, I do know this, that Las Vegas would start to look a little bit more like the kingdom of heaven. And I want to pursue that with all my being, and I hope you do too. But here's the final question. How? How do we do this? It's great to talk about why we need to do this, but we've got to answer the question how we practically do this. And let me just say this as we answer this question. I could not possibly, in the time we have together, answer and give you all the, ra- all the ways that we are going to and need to declare the gospel to the next generation and invest in them. There's no way I could do all of that in one message today. But I want to give you three guiding principles. Three guiding principles for anybody in this room. No matter who you are, no matter what role you play as a grandparent, parent, single teacher, doesn't matter. Every single person in this room can do these three things together. So here's the question. How do we invest the gospel? How do we declare the gospel in the next generation? First, we must declare the gospel, number one, by praying God's favor over the next generation. We must invest in the next generation by praying God's favor over them. I've heard it said that in the Bible, there's the biblical principle of sowing and reaping. You sow in seed and you reap a harvest. But then there's God's favor. And here's what favor is. They're sowing and they're reaping, but favor is when you reap what you did not sow. And I want to pray, and what we need is for God to pour out his favor because here's the reality. You and I, we are not perfect. We're not going to be able to do this perfectly. And what we need when it comes to the next generation is for God to pour out his grace, pour out his mercy, pour out his favor in such a strong way that we as the generation above them receive back what we even did not sow. We receive back more. This is what God's favor is. We need God's favor to be poured out on the next generation. I want to be a person who doesn't stop calling down the favor of God on the next generation until we see it. You see, this became very real to me when I became a father. I tell people all the time, in in 2020, uh, something good actually did come out of the year 2020. My son, Drake Dorner, was born. Drake Dorner. And uh, I remember all the emotions I felt when I held my son for the first time. If you're a parent, you know this feeling. Look, look at me. There I am. I didn't, look at that. Wow. Look, at, look, we have the same chins, and it's, it's called double chins. It's great. Um, I, but I remember holding Drake for the first time, 
And I remember all the emotions came to the surface of my heart. Like when he made his entrance into the world, I, I, if you know me at all, you know I'm not really a crier. Griffin and I had been, had been married for about four, three, four years at this time. We'd been together for about two years before that, so about five total years. She had never seen me cry, but when this baby came into the earth or came out of the womb, I bawled like a baby. I was crying more than he was. I, I mean, I was, there was so much emotion that I felt. And as I held him there, I held him, and I, I was so grateful to God that he had given me the gift of being a parent. I was humbled by God because I know many people don't get that privilege. I had so much love in my heart for my son. I felt overwhelmed, but here's another dominant emotion I felt as I held him. Scared out of my mind. <laughs> I was scared out of my mind. I started having thoughts like this. Do I have what it takes to raise a son? How am I going to teach my son all the things that he needs to know when I feel like I don't even know all the things that I know I need to know, right? Am I going to let him down? Am I going to be a good enough father to him? And then this was the dominant question that, that came to my mind as I held him for the first time. Will my son come to love Jesus with all of his heart? Will he come to love Jesus with all of his heart? And these thoughts, they started creating multiple responses in me. I started reading every parenting book I could get my hands on. I started listening to every parenting sermon I could listen to, every podcast. I, I did all sorts of different things. But I thank God, by the grace of God and mercy of God, this is not anything about me. This is all God's grace. I'm thankful today that the number one response I had to those thoughts in my mind was this. I became a, a praying dad. I became a praying dad because here's what I know. At the end of the day, what's going to determine whether or not my son comes to know Jesus will not be my effort to parent perfectly. It will be the sovereign grace and mercy of God being poured out on my son. A supernatural act of God has to take place for my son to love and follow Jesus with his whole heart. Therefore, the best thing I can do for my son is spend hours on my knees in prayer for him. Our founding pastor, Pastor Vance Pittman, taught us this principle that God in his sovereignty has chosen to limit his activity to the prayers of his people. Therefore, if that's true, the best thing we can do for the next generation, friends, is get on our knees and plead for hours for God's mercy and favor over their lives. Here's my question for you. Are you praying for the next generation? When it comes to your investment, are you praying for the next generation? Maybe it's your kids, maybe it's your students, maybe it's your small group, maybe it's your, your uh, nieces and nephews, I don't know, but here's my question. Are you praying God's favor over them? This is the first way that we, we can get the gospel to the next generation. Here's the second way. Number two, we must prioritize God's word to the next generation. Not only should we pray God's favor of them, but we must prioritize God's word to the next generation. Listen to this verse about God's word. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 and 17. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. Now why? So that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. You see, friends, we must understand as people pouring into the next generation that God in his sovereignty has given his people his word to transform his people into the people that he created them to be. <laughs> this is why God has given us his word, and this is why I love our next generation ministries. When it comes to Hope Kids, Hope Kids Preschool, and Hope Students, friends, we just want you to know, and we want to be very clear about this reality, that when you drop your kids off in those buildings on Sundays or on Wednesdays, we are going to care for your kids, but we want to be very clear. What we are doing in those buildings is not daycare, it's discipleship. <laughs> because what we're doing... What our team and what our leaders are doing is we're taking God's word and we're praying it over them. We're taking God's words and we're teaching it to the next generation. We're taking God's word and prioritizing and showing how it affects every area of their life. What we're doing over there in those buildings is not daycare, it's discipleship. Because we believe, literally, we believe that the only thing that can produce the true life change that we really need is God by his spirit applying God's word to the hearts of his people. 
So we want to prioritize God's word to them. That's why I'm thankful for leaders who decide every single week to invest in the next generation. I think of a man named Ron Sharp. Ron Sharp has been in our church for for about six years. And Ron Sharp, he's a retired man. and, And he has every single Wednesday night at Hope Students taken two hours of his night every single week and poured in God's word to a group of students for six years as he's been here. But here's the crazy thing. I asked Ron this week, how long, Ron, have you been doing this in student ministry? And here's what he said. For almost 30 years, he's served in student ministry. For almost 30 years, he has invested his life, his time. Mr. Ron is at almost every ball game his students have. Every single Wednesday night, he's there investing God's word into them. And if he's not, here's what he's telling me. Hey, man, I'm spending time with my grandchildren doing the same thing. (laughs) Here's what I want to say. Mr. Ron knows just how important it is to invest the gospel into the next generation. And our church is built on the backs of heroes like Ron Sharp. Mr. Ron embodies this this statement from Andy Stanley. Here's what he says. What if the greatest contribution you make in the kingdom of God isn't something you do, but somebody you raise? Man, what a quote. What if that was the the mindset that all of us had? What if the greatest contribution we can make to advancing the kingdom of God isn't something we ourselves do, but it's actually somebody we raise up? Man. And here's the final thing. We need to pray God's favor. We need to prioritize God's word. But number four, we need to pursue the radical discipleship of the next generation. We need to pursue the radical discipleship of the next generation. And I use the word radical intentionally. Here's why. I don't know if you know this, but our world, the culture we live in, friends, is a formation discipleship machine. The world is forming us whether we like it or not. The world is discipling the next generation whether we like it or not. The question is not, who are you being discipled by or are you being discipled? The question is not, are you being discipled? The only question is, who or what is doing your discipling? The world is trying to form us. This is why in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, the Apostle Paul says, Do not be conformed. Do not be conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. Why does he say that? He says that because the world's trying to form the next generation. The world is discipling the next generation, whether we like it or not. And it got me thinking about a story about a man named Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Many of you may know that name, but Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a German pastor and theologian who lived during the years of 1904 to 1945. Bonhoeffer actually lost his life trying to overthrow Hitler during World War II. And in 1933, the threat of the Nazi power was growing in Germany, and the Christian church in that day had started to compromise with the Nazi movement. It was said of Hitler that he wasn't just trying to capture countries, he was trying to capture the hearts and souls of people. You see, that's what they were doing. They are trying to form people. And this brilliant German pastor named Bonhoeffer, he decided it was time to fight back. So in 1933, he was going to fight back by starting an underground seminary for training pastors so that the church could remain committed to its convictions of the Bible and orthodoxy. And so he starts a seminary in a town called Finkenwald. And he starts this seminary, and the training of the seminary pastors was intense. It was so intense that some of Bonhoeffer's old friends started to get news about how, about how intense his training was, and, and they got a little concerned. They thought Bonhoeffer might have been losing his mind, that he had become a little too extreme in his pursuit of training these pastors. And so one of Bonhoeffer's friends decided, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to him. I'm going to travel to him. Finkenwald's in Poland. So they said, I'm going to travel to him and try to talk Bonhoeffer off a ledge. <laughs> So his friend goes, and the story is recounted that as his friend meets Bonhoeffer, Bonhoeffer takes him in a boat up onto this hill. He he travels by boat, and they get out of the boat, and they walk over on this hill. And on this hill, 
Bonhoeffer looks over the water and he points over the hill where he sees a Nazi command center, training center, where soldiers are, are walking in lines and being trained in aircrafts and are, and planes are, are landing and taking off. And this is where they were training the Nazi soldiers. And his friend was confused. Why in the world are you showing me this? And he decides, you know what, whatever. I'm going to start telling you why I think you need to relax. Why you need to chill out. Why your training doesn't need to be so extreme. And so he tells this to Bonhoeffer. And then Bonhoeffer looks at him. And he points back at Finkenwald, where his seminary is. He points back there and he says, this, what's happening here, the training here, this must be stronger than that. As he pointed at what the Nazis were doing just over the hill. This, the discipleship, the training, the intensity here, what we're trying to do here, it must be stronger than that. And as I heard that story, here's what I felt. When it comes to the discipleship of the next generation, when it comes to us making sure that they are raised in the way and truth of Jesus, here's what rose up in my heart. What we're doing here in the church and what we're going to be doing in our homes as parents, it must be stronger than that. It must be stronger than what the world's trying to do to to the next generation. The world is trying to form the next generation and what we're doing and what we're called to as the church is to be stronger. Here's my question for you. Is your investment in your kids' spiritual life stronger than the world's investment in them? Is it stronger? May we be the generation. May we be the generation of parents and individuals who think and pray and plan more towards our kids' spiritual formation than we do their sports teams. May we be the generation that cares more about their spiritual life than how much money they make. All good things, all great things, but not the ultimate thing. Is your investment in your children in the next generation stronger than the world's? We must be intentional. We must be consistent. We must be deep. But as we finish, maybe you're sitting here thinking, well, Trenton, I've done this. I've done this. I've done this, but... My kid doesn't love Jesus. I've prayed over them. You don't know how many hours I've prayed for my students, for my kids. I've prioritized God's word to them. I've I've discipled them. I've trained them. And yet they still don't love Jesus. What do you have to say to me? Here's what I would say to you. Here's the good news of the gospel, friends. The good news of the gospel, it's very clear that Jesus, when he lived and then he died the death that you and I deserve to die, but then he got out of the grave, he defeated death, hell, and the grave. Listen, Jesus' resurrection is proof, friends, that anything is possible. Because Jesus got out of the grave, there is hope for your son, for your daughter, who is still yet to come to know Jesus. The calling's too clear, message is too good alternative too costly but the opportunity is too great we must be a church that prioritizes getting the gospel to the next generation Lord Jesus God we thank you for your grace we thank you for your mercy God I pray that we would be a people that prioritizes what's on your heart the next generation and getting the gospel to the next generation. God, I pray that as we respond in just a moment, God, would you move in our hearts? Would you move in our minds? God, would you compel us, inspire us, and move us to get involved in the mission? Maybe you're sitting here today and you're thinking to yourself, Trenton, this is great. I hear it. I see the need. I see how we can do it. But the reality is, When it comes to raising my kids or the next generation in the way and truth of Jesus, I can't do that because I myself don't have a relationship with Jesus. Man, if that's you, I would encourage you. In just a moment, we're going to have some pastors down here at the front. Would you be like a sweet lady who came up to me after our Thursday service and said, I want to have a relationship with Jesus. 
Man, if you don't have a relationship with Jesus, today is the day. It's a perfect opportunity for you just to come down here and express your desire to begin one. What we'll do is we'll just connect you with one of our encouragers or encouragers who will open up a Bible and just show you from God's Word what it really means to be a follower of Jesus. But maybe you're in here today and you're like, Trent, I have a relationship with Jesus, but I'm, I'm wrestling with how I need to respond. Let me just give you two things to think about. Here's the first one. How are you prioritizing and proclaiming the gospel to the next generation? How are you doing that? In what sphere, in what environment, what group, what individual? Is there somebody on your heart that you are able to consistently and clearly proclaim the gospel and invest the gospel into? Maybe you don't have somebody like that. Would you just pray that God would give you, give you somebody to invest in in the next generation? But maybe for the rest of us, I want to plead with us. What if today as we respond, we do the first thing that we talked about here. What if we just pray God's favor over the next generation? Maybe it's your kids, your students, anybody in your life. What if we, you can do it wherever you'd like to. You can come down here on the front. You can make your seat an altar. But what if we would just, during this response time, we just prayed God's favor over the next generation. I believe with all my heart that that's the best thing that we can do for, this, for the next generation. And so I want to encourage you as we respond. We're going to have pastors down here, but this this stage here, it's an altar. It's a place for you to come and get alone with God and pray God's favor over the next generation. So I want to encourage you and plead with you. Would you come? Would you do that? Maybe you're in here and you've got a health situation, a family situation, a work situation that you would just love one of our pastors to pray for you for. We would be honored to pray for you. How are you proclaiming? How are you praying? And then in any other way, the Lord leads us to respond. Lord Jesus, we love you. God, thank you for your grace. Thank you for your mercy. God, would we be a church that prioritizes the mission of God being generational? God, would you move us? Would you compel us to pray? God, would you move us and would you compel us to proclaim? God, we want to see a next generation rise up. God, we love you. Thank you for loving us. Would you lead us as we respond now for your glory? We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand as we respond?